I have to say, I'm, you might have to indulge me if I'm emotionally moved because I've connected already to, uh, I've already connected to these lands in a very emotional and heartfelt way that hasn't happened just right here. And I'm so honored and privileged for the opportunity to even visit. I, so a little bit about myself, I'm Palestinian, um, American, uh, born in uh, the Bay Area, and I don't have a Palestinian passport or an ID card. I have an American passport. And so when I want to travel to what I call home, I travel as a tourist uh, at the whim, uh, arbitrary whim, of Israeli soldiers and the security apparatus and whether or not they deem me a threat, even if it's to visit my grandfather's home, my father's memories, my mother's playgrounds, which don't really exist anymore, but should they have existed. And I travel as that tourist because my father's ID card was revoked in secret. And this was part of a widespread policy between 1967 and 2004 to revoke the ID cards of Palestinian ID holders from the occupied territory uh, secretly without due process in what amounts to the revocation of approximately 140,000 revocations. And it's called, it's been called, and come to be known as secret deportation, and it was used as a policy deliberately to socially engineer the population of Palestinians and to ensure a certain demographic outcome. And but for this secret revocation and this policy, the Palestinian population in the West Bank alone would be greater by 14%. So I start with that story to tell you that growing up in the Bay Area, I was very aware of my position as an immigrant, a first generation immigrant, and very aware of my position as a settler, be it by choice or not, and in solidarity with indigenous nations who are seeking their self-determination and waging my own struggle along with my people and those in solidarity with us for our self-determination. And I've heeded the words of Ha'unani Trask, who asked that if you are also in solidarity with the struggle of, I guess, the land of the, the salt water? One salt water. The one salt water? Then do not visit as a tourist. And so I'm so grateful for this invitation, and especially grateful to Cindy who's extended it, along with an entire team of dedicated activists and just peace workers and, and people who are, we're so grateful for because they're making this world so much better. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I have been asked, obviously, the, the call of this is to discuss the Gaza Strip because the Gaza Strip has been emblazoned in our mind, especially this summer. So it's very, very recent. It's, very, it's still fresh. It's still painful. And the, the, the operation that took place this summer against the Gaza Strip was one of three similar large-scale operations against the Palestinian population that lived there in the past six and a half years, and one of 14 operations that have taken place against the Gaza Strip since unilateral withdrawal in 2005, and one of 22 operations that have taken place since the announcement of unilateral withdrawal and the exchange of letters from, between Ariel Sharon and George uh, w. Bush in 2004, and it's part of an new, I can't even count the number of operations that have taken place against the Gaza Strip since the occupation in 1967, and then before that, the displacement of refugee populations into the Gaza Strip in 1948. And so I'm, to have this discussion about the Gaza Strip, however, I'm going to take a step back to place it into context into the rest of the story of Palestine because, as I will show, the struggle isn't a struggle against any particular Palestinian group like Hamas or the Islamic Jihad or Fatah or otherwise. This is a struggle. Israel doesn't have a Gaza problem. Israel has a Palestine problem and a problem with Palestinians. So when I'll begin 
by just sharing one of the most basic assumptions and something that was thrown at me several times over the summer as we had these discussions in public fora, which was, this is a battle between Israel, which has a right to defend itself, and Hamas, which has been incessantly lobbying mortar rockets over the border indiscriminately at civilians in a rage uh, to kill driven by some uh, deeply held religious animosity, right? And in the news media, I can hardly give a lesson, right, that that would merit, but the reason that that framework has emerged so strong and so resilient is because there has been an effort not to, to police this conversation altogether, right? So to even be able to have this conversation is evidence of how far we've come. And even now, this conversation, as we're having it, is still being policed. My protests and even my political analysis is labeled as somehow um, anti-Semitic, even though the movement that I represent represents a movement against bigotry of all kinds, including that bigotry against Jewish people. And I believe in coexistence. And I believe that is, there, we have, there is no mutual exclusive history. Um, and so the basic assumption that I'll just throw at you right now and what I hope to unpack to, throughout the discussion is this idea that if indeed this is about Hamas rocket fire, then it merits questioning that if the first Hamas mortar rocket was fired into Israel in March 2001, which was 13 years ago, right? Then what was going on for the nearly five decades of conflict before that? And what was going on that unraveled and destroyed the peace process by the year 2000? If it's truly about rocket fire, and I don't think it's about rocket fire. I think that this is about <coughs> Israel's policy vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian people, which has, for whatever reasons that Israel was established, uh, virtuous or not, has uh, embarked on a policy throughout all uh, what was known as Mandate Palestine because of its reference under the British Mandate as a policy of settler colonialism. And that is one that is built on twin axioms. The first is the confiscation of as much land as possible with the least number of Palestinians on it as possible. And the second is the concentration of the greatest number of Palestinians as possible on the smallest area of land. So it's confiscation of the greatest land with the least amount of Palestinians, coupled with the concentration of the greatest amount, number of Palestinians on the smallest amount of land. And so what you have throughout the West Bank and Israel proper today is a series of either ghettos within Israel or what looks like Bantu stones or reservations in the Gaza Strip, excuse me, in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip, it's one large concentration. Um, and I will, I guess I'll, I'll show you that. Can I show this? Maybe if we have light. I'll show you what it looks like today before I go back. So this is the West Bank. And you can see that this is the West Bank that was with the Gaza Strip to be the Palestinian state. So I'm starting from the end. I'm doing something very lawyerly for the lawyers in the audience. I'm starting from the conclusion. I'll work backwards. So but this is where Palestinians live in the West Bank, which is slated to be the Palestinian state, in these non-contiguous areas of land. What is the rest of this landmass? Those have become the sites of settlements, of settlements built by Israel for Jews only. So it's not public mixed housing for Palestinians and Jews under Israeli administrative control. It is built by the state to house Jewish 
persons exclusively who then have access to roads that are for those Israelis only, demarcated by different colored license plates. They have yellow license plates, Palestinians have green license plates so that they cannot ride, ride on these roads. And they're accompanied by the presence of soldiers, Israeli soldiers, who then protect the settlers from the Palestinians because obviously they are not safe in an area where they were not invited and they did not come as neighbors, but came as conquerors. And this is accompanied by a whole series of policies that includes the maldistribution of water resources, the control of trade, that includes checkpoints to know where Palestinians are driving to and from, that includes the annexation wall. You mentioned the wall, Tim. The annexation wall, which runs through the West Bank in order to circumscribe the settlements. 85% of the length of the wall runs through the West Bank, confiscating 13% of this. And so it separates Palestinians from Palestinians, children from their school, farmers from their land, families from one another, and not necessarily Israelis from Palestinians. This is the West Bank, where there are, there is no rocket fire from the West Bank ever. But instead, there is the presence of the Palestinian Authority, ruled by Fatah, which has been one of the most compliant uh, authorities ever to lead Palestinians, and in fact, thanks to the United States, have also trained Palestinian security officers to protect the settlers and the settlements from Palestinians, rather than to resist the occupation. And yet, despite this most compliant leadership, despite the security arrangement, Israeli authorities continue to bifurcate Palestinians from one another geographically and politically. And so rockets cannot explain this. If you look within Israel itself, within Israel, and I'll, oh, this is the West Bank, to look at it more dramatically. If you look within Israel itself, this policy is also taking place vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian citizens of Israel who never fled Israel upon its establishment in 1948, who grew from a population of 100,000 to 1.2 million today, or 20% of Israel's population. But they will forever be second-class citizens within Israel, notwithstanding the fact that they can vote, notwithstanding the fact that they can be represented in the Knesset or the Israeli government, because they lack Jewish nationality. And within Israel, there is a bifurcation of law between Jewish nationality and Israeli citizenship. So that if you are a Jewish national and an Israeli citizen, you have a whole host of rights that are denied to the Israeli citizen only, who cannot acquire Jewish nationality, right? And so that means that as a result of this arrangement in law, Palestinian citizens of the state are also policed, who are under military rule from 1948 to 1966, before the occupation in 1967, and are today subject to a whole host of discrimin uh, discriminatory treatment, no less than 50 Israeli laws that on their face discriminate explicitly against them or privilege their Jewish counterparts, despite the fact that they are all citizens. And the developments recently within Israel have actually become even more extreme and rightward. There is um, Prime Minister Netanyahu, for those of you who are following the recent conflagrations in Jerusalem and the protests within Israel amongst the Palestinian population rather than defend Palestinian citizens, Palestinian Israelis, their right to protest and their civic participation in the only democracy in the Middle East, said that they
they should just leave. Right? So this is very explicit. And in terms of their concentration, they're concentrated mostly in the Galilee. This is a map of the Negev Desert. And here, the Bedouin tribes in the Negev, the Palestinian tribes there, there is something called the Power Plan that seeks to remove the Palestinians, uh, about 70,000 of them, from their homes in the Negev and their agricultural livelihoods, right? And place them into urban townships so that they can be civilized. This shouldn't be new to anybody, I'm sure. And in the place of their homes, they will also build a Jewish only settlement, even within Israel. And the Jewish National Fund will build a fort, plant a forest, and cover the memory of those that were there before. But there are no rockets from within Israel against Israelis. These are Palestinian citizens of the state who are treated like this simply because they are Palestinian. And here is the Gaza Strip. What happens in the West Bank by martial law and happens in East Jerusalem by a mix of martial and administrative law and happens within Israel as a result of civil law, happens in Gaza as a result of warfare. But the outcome is the same. It's the, either the concentration of Palestinians or their removal. And here, you can see as a result of the Gaza Strip, and I'm going to be moving backwards at this point, the Gaza Strip is a 365 square mile territory on the eastern shore of, uh, to the east of what Israel proper, and it's difficult to say to the east of Israel because Israel has never declared its borders. So to say to the east of Israel is a bit of a uh, conundrum, creates a bit of a conundrum because Israel never created those borders, they're still expanding. And so, but this is to the east of Israel, I should say to the west of Israel, excuse me, and to the east of Egypt, okay? And look what happens as a result of this summer's war. The buffer zone has expanded to now 44% of the Gaza Strip. And 1.8 million Palestinians are concentrated into one of the most densely populated areas on Earth, right? And so here we can see how this was accomplished. Here's a map from UNRWA that shows us the expansion of an already densely populated area. And so the, the end of the story is, this is not about rocket fire. This is about a policy vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians. And the greatest transgression that Palestinians has committed has been the refusal to submit to the fate of being erased. The refusal to be incorporated into Egypt or to move to Jordan because there's 22 Arab states and they should just be absorbed into any one of them. The greatest transgression is the commitment to be Palestinian, the commitment to remain on their land, the commitment to be alive and to be recognized. And that has been the greatest threat to Israel and what's framed in many ways, in many, many, I think, duplicitous <coughs> ways as anti-Semitism, when in fact it is a people's will to resist, to exist. Okay, so then where does this story begin? Here, I mentioned the British mandate which looks like this, and it's the British Mandate. As we know, the entire Middle East is divided up by the Sykes-Picot Agreement in 1916 between the French and the British mostly. So this comes under British control and is meant to be held in trusteeship under, something, uh, under the League of Nations mandate system. And it was said that it was the closest to actually transitioning into Arab rule. The problem is that Jewish people in Europe are dealing with systematic bigotry. A Europe that has excluded Jews 
because they do not fit the universal conception of what it means to be an enlightened citizen, and so they can never fully belong. They are outliers. And so in response to the Jewish question, there are many responses. Some of them happen to be socialist responses in order to eviscerate nationalism and fit within Europe without distinction. Another response is Zionism, which is the creation of a Jewish homeland where Jews can be recognized and be safe and away from this type of systematic persecution. And amongst those territories that Jews, uh, I guess the Zionist pioneers, where they want to create this homeland, include Uganda, Mozambique, and Palestine. And all of them have in common that they are colonial holdings. So the idea that this was the only homeland for Jewish person belies a history that isn't about just a return. Of course, this has religious significance for Jewish people that's undeniable. It should be accessible by them. But it's not driven by this religious connection as much as it's driven by a political desire to escape persecution. But the Palestinian Arabs who live here are also under colonial subjugation who are seeking their self-determination and have been promised that by the British as they enter World War I. The British simultaneously make a promise in the form of a letter to Jewish people that says, you shall have a homeland in Palestine. So there are, so this is directly derivative of a colonial order and competing promises that cannot be reconciled. But the reason that it isn't much of a problem, just to offer you more context, at the time, I guess it's still enduring, the Arabs are not civilized. The Arabs cannot govern themselves. So this famous uh, myth that Palestine is a land without a people <clears throat> for a people without a land is not in reference that there were no people here, but it's in reference to the concept of peoplehood under international law, which says that peoples have a right to self-determination. So it wasn't that the Palestinians weren't present, it's that they didn't amount to people who merited and deserved a homeland and were able to govern themselves. This then becomes almost a fate accompli after uh, World War I and the systematic uh, massacre and genocidal attempt to annihilate Jewish persons. And so what was once subject to controversy about where should Zionism prevail over socialism, should it be Palestine, should it be elsewhere, becomes a moot issue in the aftermath of World War II and the Holocaust. And now we have an uh, international community that is very much a part of establishing a Jewish homeland here, notwithstanding the presence of an other indigenous population. What to do with them? There is an option to live with them, except one of uh, Israel's two-time prime minister of Israel and a, a, another Zionist pioneer, David Ben-Gurion, established or, or held, purported, that in order to have a Jewish homeland, it has to have a population of at least an 80% majority. So there's a demographic thrust to what this homeland looks like. And based on that, coupled with the presence of an indigenous population, there could not be coexistence. And instead, and this has been well documented by Israeli historian Ilan Pape, in the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, there was a plan to depopulate this area with as many from its Palestinian population. In the midst of this, the UN, the UN proposes Resolution 181, to create two homelands, one for Arabs, one for Jews. The proposal was rejected by Arabs because the proposal said 
that Palestinians who own 94% of the land would be given 45% of it, of the least uh, fertile land, and that Jewish persons who own 6% of the land would be given 55% of the most fertile areas. And so this results in the rejection of the plan, although historians have also revealed that Zionist pioneers weren't interested either, right? But the rejection of the proposal precipitates what is known as the 1948 Arab-Israeli War. Israel prevails and establishes itself where we see these lines demarcating the West Bank and the Gaza Strip in 1948. 700,000 of the 800,000 indigenous Palestinians who lived here flee, became refugees, and together with the refugees from 1967, including their descendants, are now a population of approximately 6.5 million Palestinian refugees globally. Okay? Israel does not want to return the refugees or allow for their return and has actually framed the call for the return of those refugees as anti-Semitic because it considers that the return of six and a half million refugees to this area today would disrupt the Jewish demographic majority. Okay? So this isn't about the destruction of Israel by way of some murderous campaign, but that Israel, as it's defined itself as an 80% majority of Jewish persons, would be destroyed by being outnumbered by another, by an indigenous population that would seek to return. Okay? So what happens then? Why, if this is the history, do we only, frankly, if we start from the occupied territories, we're lucky. Most of the time, in recent history, we've only started from Gaza, as if it's some floating island filled with terrorists trying to invade Israel, right? So, clearly, that's not true. It's not an island, or filled with terrorists. Um, so Gaza and the West Bank. West Bank comes under the control of Jordan. Gaza comes under the control of Egypt. And from 1948 to 1966, Israel rules the Palestinian population that doesn't leave under martial law, which is derived, again, from British colonial order and established by emergency law, that it then suspends in 1966 and applies to the West Bank and the Gaza Strip upon occupation. Okay? Um, and the idea that Israel, there's a lot of narrative about what precipitated <laughs> in the Six-Day War, the, 19, the 1967 war and occupation, Israel claims that it was a preemptive war because the Egyptians were uh, mounting the troops on the border. They still wanted to attack. There's a lot of discussion. If we look at it, and, and, and we can talk about this more in the Q&A, we're talking about one of the most rich sources of water located here under the West Bank, the Western Aquifer, where Israel derives 60% of it runs through the West Bank. Israel derives 80% of that yield. And it's also the head of two riverheads, the Yadmuk and the Litani. So in many ways, and many historians have characterized this as a war over water. But Israel has also always set its sights on the West Bank and Gaza. The West Bank has religious significance as Judea and Samaria, but it also has significance because of the security concerns that we should move to the borders before the borders come to us. And so well before 1967, an Israeli um, civil ser servant by the name of Yigal Alon developed something called the Alon Plan, which mapped out settlement construction throughout the West Bank well before 1967. And if you graph that Alon Plan onto a map of the West Bank today, there's almost perfect symmetry. Okay, 1967 war happens. Now Israel controls the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. The UN Security Council immediately issues resolutions 242 and 338. Israel must withdraw from territories occupied 
1967. And Israel has resisted this mandate. So for those of you who study international law, unlike the General Assembly, whose resolutions are basically, you know, statements of Congress or sense of Congress, the UN Security Council resolutions are actually international law. And Israel has resisted the application of this law and the laws of occupation that would attempt to occupy territory by legal maneuver in two ways. The first is to say that the Security Council resolutions didn't specify which territories because it lacked the preposition the. It just says withdraw from occupied territory without specificity. The second, it says, is that this, that unlike Hawaii, that the West Bank and the Gaza Strip lacked Palestinian sovereignty and were instead under the control of Jordan and Egypt, respectively, and therefore occupying them isn't really de jure occupation because they weren't a state to begin with. So there's two legal arguments against this occupied status, notwithstanding the fact that it was that Palestinians were recognized as entitled to self-determination at least by um, the promises of the British, then UN Resolution 181, and then Security Council Resolutions 242 and 338. And because of these legal obfuscations, Israel has, from that moment onward, encroached upon the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And what we see in the, Ga in the West Bank, I've showed you a map of what the West Bank looks, to, looks like today because of the settlements. The settler population has grown from 200,000 in 1993 in the West Bank to 600,000 today. Not, dis, not in spite of the peace process, but because of the terms of the peace process. The peace process between the PLO and Israel, solely brokered by the United States and signed in 1993 on the White House lawn, by its very terms, removed international law from the framework so that it has nothing to do with the resolution to the conflict. So unlike in South Africa, unlike in Northern Ireland, unlike in Bosnia-Herzegovina, where peace was established based on sets of fundamental rights, here we have a conflict where the U.S. insisted that law and rights would impede, would impede the approximation to peace. Clearly, retrospect, for those who didn't have the foresight to know how ludicrous that was, retrospect and maps, which we rarely see on television either, helps demonstrate the baselessness of that position. And so under international law, Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, which applies to, which regulates how a belligerent should regulate its occupation, says, prohibits the transfer of one's civilian population into territory that it occupies. Violation of Article 149 amounts to a grave breach under Article 147 and is tantamount to a war crime because occupation is not illegal. Occupation is expected as a result of war, but it's meant to be short-term in nature. Five to 10 years, we recently just ended our occupation of Iraq. It's not a novelty, but because we have this expectation that occupation will exist, we also have an attendant series of laws to protect those under occupation. First, Israel rejected that as by legal obfuscation, and then the United States, as a result of the peace process, completely dismissed those terms of reference and said that the peace process would be totally self-referential, dominated by politics and pragmatism only. And again, what does politics mean for Israel, the 11th most powerful military in the world, the only nuclear power in the Middle East, the recipient of the largest amount of U.S. aid, more than all of Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America combined, 
V, who which also received unequivocal diplomatic, economic, and military aid from the U.S. And the U.S. is the sole broker, vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians organizing themselves at the time under the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which means a non-state group that has no formal army, no equivalent support politically, economically, diplomatically, militarily, the terms can only be devastating because they don't have the political leverage to use during political negotiations absent those terms of reference that international law has afforded. So this was not by mistake that it happened. All right. But then if this is the situation, and today in the West Bank we have, we like Fateh, for those of you who didn't know, the United States likes the Palestinian Authority that governs the West Bank and funds them. And the international donor community floods millions into the West Bank and anything that's governed by Fateh, because we like Fateh. And yet, in the Gaza Strip, we have a completely different situation of warfare. Why didn't Gaza end up like the West Bank as well? So again, I'll start from the end and say that Fetah was in the Gaza Strip until 2006. That's when Hamas comes to govern the Gaza Strip. So here's a brief history. Oh, this, I don't have the slide that was to show you the expansion of settlements, but you should check out, this is an Israeli group called Peace Now, and their counterpart in the US is Americans for Peace Now. This map demonstrates the expansion of settlements throughout the West Bank and how Israel has, by its own doing, undermined and destroyed the two-state solution. Okay, so what happens in Gaza? Why is Gaza not like the West Bank today? Not for a lack of trying. Israel tried to occupy Gaza first in 1956 and under the administration of President Eisenhower, withdrew four months later but returns in 1967 to occupy uh, the Gaza Strip as a result of that occupation and under the governance of Ariel Sharon, who is responsible for the Southern Command, basically creates uh, urban planning and roads in the Gaza Strip, something like 200 miles of road uh, to, to basically facilitate occupation. I think from what I learned today from my sovereignty tour, similar to the construction of H1, H2, and H3, which connect military bases and military sites. And so this idea of planning in order to facilitate military presence is alive and well in the Gaza Strip. And so it's not for a lack of trying to occupy the Gaza Strip, but unlike the West Bank, which is under Jordanian rule, which has it under much tighter control, at that time, Gaza was supported by the Egyptian Arab, uh, pan-Arab national socialist uh, governance of Jamal Abdel Nasser, or an Egyptian Gamal Abdel Nasser, who you may remember, for those of you who know something about the Middle East, and supported military resistance in the Gaza Strip. And it was very difficult to occupy it and to suppress it in similar ways. And as a result, Israel slowed its, its desire and Maintaining the Gaza Strip diminished steadily to the point where it had, by 1993, even before, by 1993 it became an explicit policy from the mouth of former President Shimon Peres that Gaza would be the future Palestinian state. That was going to be the state. But that the West Bank would be a mix of Israeli settlers and Palestinians in a political solution that would be established later. In preparation for making Gaza the Palestinian state, we see a number of trends. One is, of course, out of Israel's hands altogether. It has nothing to do with Israel, but it's the, it's the Gulf, first Gulf War, where the PLO chairman Yasser Arafat supports Saddam Hussein of Iraq to occupy Kuwait in retribution once that occupation ends. Kuwait expels all the Palestinians from there, which costs the Palestinians approximately 50% of their GNP in remittances. Israel, that same year in 1991, ceases to use Palestinian labor 
as cheap labor within Israel and replaces them with foreign labor, which is also a significant source of revenue and income. Together, we reduce the uh, dependence on the Gaza Strip, dependence on food aid rises from 10,000 in 1990 to 120,000 by 1991. So we're already creating a situation of impoverishment and, and a lack of uh, uh, self-sustenance. This balances at approximately 80,000 by 1993 of families receiving food aid for survival who need it. After the war, this summer, that number is 830,000 Palestinians who cannot survive <coughs> without food aid. As a result of the siege, of impoverishment, and of policies that are meant to, uh, to, to bring Palestinians in the Gaza Strip to essentially capitulate, right? And so, what, let me just do a quick um, timeline for you. That's 1991, the same year as the Madrid peace process, which is the secret negotiations to establish uh, the Oslo Accords. Um, and the Oslo Accords are signed in September 1993. In March 1993, Israel imposes full closure of the Gaza Strip. And this is lost even in our recent history because we refer to the siege of Gaza as beginning in 2006 upon Hamas's parliamentary victory. But in fact, Gaza has been under closure since 1993 in March, not as severe as it is today. Now. By December 1993, Shimon Peres addresses a UNESCO conference and announces Gaza will be the Palestinian state, the West Bank's uh, status will be determined later. The first Palestinian suicide attack against Israelis is in April 1994. So we've had that entire history from 1948 until 1994 without suicide bombings, without rockets, and yet a very uniform policy. And that is said, at least what uh, those who took responsibility, said that it was in response to the Ibrahimi Mosque massacre. The Ibrahimi Mosque is a mosque in Hebron, which is today one of the worst and most violent sites of Israeli uh, settler colonial control. Because the settlement is built in the middle of the city, displacing all Palestinians around it, and every Israeli civilian who comes to live in the middle of this Palestinian city where Palestinians have been displaced is afforded at least one soldier per capita to Israeli civilian living illegally in Hebron is something one soldier and at times three soldiers. And the rest of the city is policed by barbed wire, by roads that Palestinians can't travel on. It's been devastating. So for those of you who have visited, you know that the most violent site is Hebron. In Hebron, where the settlers, frankly, are very extreme and aren't loyal to Israel as much as they're committed to remaining on what they consider land that God gave to them. So they're committed to being in Judea and Samaria and are much more committed to remaining on that land regardless of what the state of Israel does. But they're protected by the state. So they're not just lone wolves. They attacked a group of pay, uh, praying Muslims in the mosque and killed 29. Uh, pious worshippers, and that was said to be the first suicide attack follows that in 1994. Netanyahu, who is now in government today, represents the Likud, which is historically the right, right, has now become the center in Israeli politics, we can talk about that, but he's elected in 1996 and from the beginning rejected a two-state solution. In 2000, the Camp David Accords um, collapses, the Camp David Summit, where Israel was said to offer uh, Palestinians the most, Abu Barak offered Palestinians the most generous offer, which is actually not generous at all, considering the red lines. That collapses in 2000. Between the signing of the peace process and 2000, right, the first seven years of the peace process, the settler population in the West Bank doubles. 
under the peace process. And because there's no way to regulate something without terms of reference like law, and who is going to hold the US world superpower to account? What court, what state, what pressure? And so we see these devastating consequences by September 2000. The second Intifada, or the Palestinian uprising, begins in September 2000. This Intifada means literally uprising, and it's very militarized in ways that is different than the first uprising between 1987 and 1991, where slingshots and children were the features of that kind of resistance but where there was also a policy to break the bones of Palestinian children who threw rocks, right? Those are the blazing images for those. By the second intifada, it's completely different. It's no longer just about Palestinian children with rocks. It's a much more militarized confrontation, and one that's marked by a series of suicide attacks, and one that's also marked by rocket fire into Israel. But since Israel, has basically squashed that uh, militant movement, um, had, or militarized uprising, I should say, which didn't exclude civilians altogether, but what they were excluded. Israel has been relatively calm for most Israelis, who, if you visit Israel and talk to them, they recognize that there is an occupation, but it seems so far away. It's distant because of the quiet, right? minus conflagrations like the summer, minus what's happening in Jerusalem today. But those are exceptions. Those are exceptions in a policy that is unabated against Palestinians in times of kinetic violence and in times of peace, which I never call peace because it's structural violence against Palestinians. So that is up until 2001. 2004, Ariel Sharon and George Bush exchanged letters. Ariel Sharon offers to withdraw all of the settlers from the Gaza Strip, approximately 8,000 at the time, in exchange for being able to determine the final borders of the West Bank. So no longer along the lines that we saw. But unilaterally, George Bush says, great idea. Go for it. So 2005, so this is the number of operations against the Gaza Strip between 2004 um, and 2008 that we don't care about. There's hardly a day that goes by where there is not some sort of military operation against Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. There's not a single day where a fisherman doesn't go out to try to fish, and because of Israel's siege, cannot go out past three nautical miles. And if they go past three nautical miles, are forced to strip and to jump into the water and swim back to shore naked, and Israeli military will confiscate their only source of livelihood. If there's a deliberate policy to impoverish the Palestinian population, because if it was just about security, not that would not be necessary. And in fact, the Oslo Accords determined that fishermen would be able to fish up to 20 nautical miles. And in the June 2008 ceasefire, it was six nautical miles. And now we're at three nautical miles, and slowly diminishing where Palestinians can't even feed themselves. Hence, the 830,000 Palestinians who have become dependent on other people just to survive. And because of the siege, the World Health Organization says that the Gaza Strip will be unlivable by the year 2020. That's six years from now. Gaza will be unlivable. It will be like Mars. If you can't survive on Mars, you can't survive in the Gaza Strip. So whether or not we're watching warfare, Gazans are at imminent risk. Palestinians in Gaza are at imminent risk. So here's a quick update. 2005, Israel unilaterally withdraws. Hamas wins parliamentary elections by January 2006. Immediately, Israel tightens the siege. Palace, uh, the U.S., Europe, and Israel support Fateh. Remember Fateh? They support Fateh in a military coup against Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Since they won parliamentary elections, they provided weapons and intelligence to them to overthrow Hamas. Hamas overthrows Fateh instead, 
and ousted them from the Gaza Strip in June 2007. At that point, Gaza was completely sealed off. Land siege, naval blockade. And there's nothing but violence after that and confrontation between uh, militant groups in, in, in the Gaza Strip in Israel. Egypt negotiates a ceasefire in June 2008. And then for those of you, I hope this is at least recent memory, Israel breaks that ceasefire in November 2008. And what has been said that Ehud Barak, who was then the defense minister of Israel, had planned since January of that year. And that precipitates the beginning of Operation Cast Lem. 21 day assault onto the Gaza Strip that left approximately 1,400 Palestinians dead, approximately a third of them children. And that, this operation, I think, was a significant turning point for anybody paying attention or not paying attention to the Middle East because it seemed like something was wrong, that Israel had gone too far. And so one would think that this would be the end of a similar operation, and yet it isn't. In November 2012, the ceasefire is falling apart, and Israel assassinates Ahmed al-Jabari, the Hamas uh, negotiator, who is reviewing Israel's terms for a negotiated ceasefire between Israel and Hamas, is assassinated, precipitates another eruption, resulting in an eight-day operation known as Operation Pillar of Cloud that kills 100. Palestinians, and then we said, okay, this has to be the last one because Israel would never do this again. The world would be outraged to continue to decimate a population that is already stateless, under siege, and is effectively defenseless, which is not to say that the rockets aren't deplorable, but that they can't defend Palestinians. And then we have this summer. And this summer, without going, of course, I'm happy to answer in the Q&A, but what we have is the kidnapping of three Israeli settler boys and their murder. Israel immediately points fingers at Hamas. Hamas immediately refutes any responsibility for it. A two-week operation in the West Bank known as Operation Brothers Keeper, where nine Palestinians were killed, 1,300 sites were invaded, uh, and 800 Palestinians who were released in the prisoner exchange rearrested before, and Netanyahu the entire time is trying to draw Hamas into this because of domestic, his own domestic troubles, his failure to uh, prevent unity government between Fatah and Hamas, failure to prevent U.S. rapprochement with Iran, failure to prevent the ascendancy of Ruben Rivlin to the presidency of Israel's Knesset, and the failure of the peace process which the U.S. blamed Israel for, drags Hamas into this confrontation, Hamas responds, we begin Operation Protective Edge, which we witnessed this summer, 51 days, where laws of armed conflict were turned on their head, 2,100 Palestinians were killed, 519 of them were children. 18,000 people have become homeless. 100,000 homes were destroyed. 1,500 children, Palestinian children, have become orphans. Israel attacked Gaza's water treatment plant. Israel attacked the power plant, the source of electricity. Israel attacked seven UN Relief Works Agency schools providing shelter in one case. In the Jabalia refugee camp, UNRWA provided the coordinates to Israel 17 times. We are providing shelter to civilians. There are no weapons stored here. There are no militants shooting from here. <coughs> Do not shoot. Israel shot anyway and killed 17 Palestinians, including four children in that incident. In other incidents, one of the most horrific for me as a spectator, watching what my tax dollars were doing, was the launching of two missiles onto Gaza's shores. And if any of you, you have a beautiful shore. So does Gaza. They just can't use it to the same extent. But a beautiful shore on the Mediterranean coast. Four boys from the Beckett family were playing on that shore, age 9 through 11. 
and they were shot by Israeli missiles. And to the chagrin of Israel's military officers, the hotel where journalists were staying was right on the shore who watched this. Witnessed, first missile come, kill the first child, and then the second missile come and kill three other children where there were no weapons, where there were no militants, but where there are children like there would be in any other population. And so here we come to the present day, and I'll say this, that even these deaths and this horrific outcome, Israel doesn't deny, but instead blames Palestinians for their own deaths, and says that Hamas positioned itself in these uh, civilian areas, hit its rockets. We had no choice but to shoot at them. They used their own people as shields. Netanyahu literally said, don't believe the pictures you're watching on television. Hamas is using them because they're telegenically effective. So even in the moment of the most sacred moment of death, Palestinians are being blamed and being usurped of their victimhood and being um, shown to be heartless, less than human. They don't care about life. They don't value life. Mothers don't care about their children, right? Even in this moment. And so I'm going to leave that to Q&A to ask me, but just suffice it to say is that there has been no proof of what Israel says. And the reason there's been no proof is because Israel hasn't provided it. The only, and Israel has used this narrative of, of, of the vic that Palestinians and Lebanese are to blame for their own death several times before. Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, Amnesty International have investigated this, have disproved that that was the case. And today, Israel won't allow an investigation, has refused Human Rights Watch entry, has refused Amnesty International entry, has refused the Human Rights Council entry, now Netanyahu is pressuring UNRWA not to conduct its own investigations. If there was nothing to hide, there should not be fear. But instead, Israel frames that all of these bodies, everybody who works on human rights, is biased against Israel. And that's the problem, as opposed to what the real problem is, which is we have a situation of settler colonialism that is supported by world superpower in our modern times. And we have framed this issue as one about terrorism versus modern state security, obfuscating this entire history, moving us farther and farther away from a solution, which I promise you is within reach if we break out of these confining and destructive narratives. And so for Palestinians, they seek to live with dignity and peace. They seek not to remove Israelis, but to live as neighbors with Israelis. Not to live as colonial subjects, but to live as equals. And that is what is so threatening about the demand for freedom, dignity, and justice today. And I thank you so much for allowing me to share uh, the narrative with you. mandated that it be on the 1949 armistice line. But even that was seen as 
very controversial for Israelis who said that that's not fair. What about the settlers who live across the line, right? This solution, I think, has been destroyed. But Israel has destroyed that solution deliberately in the ways that I showed the, the tripling of the settler population, the entrenchment of the maldistribution of water, the removal of Palestinians from their home, and what we're seeing today in East Jerusalem. I didn't talk a lot about East Jerusalem, even though we're in a church, and it might have seemed very appropriate. East Jerusalem was slated to be the Palestinian capital. Israel insists that it be the unified capital of Israel. So international law says it's the Palestinian capital. Israel says no, it's, it's all belongs to Israel. Israel annexes East Jerusalem in 1981. Nobody recognizes this annexation, however. Does it sound familiar? <laughs> Nobody yes. recognizes the annexation, even if the United States has not moved its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem in protest of this annexation. And yet under this framework, Israel has steadily diminished the population of Palestinians. Palestinian East Jerusalemites, who unlike their Israeli counterparts, are not citizens of the state, and unlike their West Bank counterparts are not stateless civilians. Instead, they have something called a residency card that's very tenuous. It gives them temporary residency. So what it says is that Palestinians who live in Jerusalem, here's this card which gives you permission to stay. So they are basically seeing that their presence is a privilege to even be in East Jerusalem, even though that's been their home their entire life. So Israel, again, has now embarked on a serious campaign to diminish that Palestinian population. Um, retroactive taxes apply to them that they can't pay that forces them to leave. Settler takeovers of homes, where settlers literally enter somebody's home protected by soldiers and police. Palestinian families can do nothing, so they leave. The building of new military infrastructure. And uh, now we see other ways, the denial, uh, exclusion from the job market, the denial of social services, all intended to displace those Palestinians. So all of this is to tell you, just in a nutshell, that the one solution that would have been, ex that does have international consensus, does comply with international law, was within Israel's reach, and they, they there's no reason, I and mean, they, they destroyed it. Why? And my opinion is, is because they're seeking to establish a hegemonic rule over the entire area. Once their control has become something that one cannot resist, right? Similar to what the United States has done to its indigenous population, right? Now the United States recognizes Native Americans. Just like Native American Month, where we can celebrate that, right? We even name our football teams after that. <laughs> have casinos too? <laughs> there was a casino. There was a casino in Area A, which is 6% of the West Bank in Jericho, destroyed during the Second Intifada. Yes, these parallels are so striking that it's not canny. And so now the solution is what I think is the de facto reality, which is that Israel controls Israel, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip. There's a single jurisdiction controlling the entire area. The only thing, and the populations are inextricably populated and live so close to one another. Settlers and Palestinians can be this far away from one another, between me and you. So it's not a geographic distance. The distance is the distance in law. You, I'm a Palestinian, I get to be Palestinian. So you, as an Israeli settler, have more rights to be there and are protected by state subsidy and by an army and by roads that belong to you. And now Israel is building a train system by Veolia to connect all the settlements to one another and to Jerusalem. They'll never have to even see a Palestinian. And so we, Palestinians and Israelis frankly live in a one state reality. But a one state reality where laws 
create this gulf between Jewish nationals and Palestinians. And so I believe the solution is going to be a state where we all live together, but where that gulf and that divide is removed. And we live as equals, counterparts, as citizens of a single state, and a secular state. Now, I say it's within reach because I also see it as somewhat inevitable. There's only two ways we can go with this. Either Israel's hegemonic project is going to prevail, Palestinians are going to have that condition of living in reservations, or we're going to end up in a single state solution. That's where we're going. Where we decide to align ourselves in this historical moment will determine which outcome actually prevails. Do you, I, you, I, I can hear you if you don't hear mine. Do you see uh, parallels with South Africa as a solution? Yes, I do see the parallel of South Africa, I think, is the, the solution that comes to mind. So again, how many lawyers are in the room? All right, I think there's not more of us. Um, but I, 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 I study law, so don't worry. I'm not messing up anybody's life, I hope. So I study law, and part of that study We've come across the Apartheid Convention, which is the, the, the suppression of the crime against Apartheid, which is legislated by the UN General Assembly in 1973, okay? Which is then incorporated into the 1998 Rome Statute, which is what creates the uh, International Criminal Court. So when I say and I analyze the situation as being a situation of Apartheid, Obviously, what I'm describing is divide, right? I'm using the law as my model. I don't use South Africa as my model because I think it's not necessarily, they're not exactly the same. Kind of what John was saying, the struggles aren't exactly the same even though they're resonant. But South Africa, for example, blacks couldn't vote, didn't serve in government, right? Um, never had self-government because Bantu stans were rejected as opposed to the Palestinian government where they've been accepted, right? But also, as Desmond Tutu has said, South Africans have never dealt with warships and aerial and ground defensive against their people, um, even during the worst of times, notwithstanding the fact that the uh, African National Congress and the head of it, Nelson Mandela, were always termed as terrorists, right? And Nelson Mandela, was it removed from the United States terrorist list until 1998? So, do I see parallels? I see that the apartheid convention applies very aptly. I see parallels in the way that uh, we have discriminatory rule that separates people by virtue of law and using the law very deliberately and purposefully. I also see differences, right? But I do hope that the outcome is somewhat similar to South Africa, though in the South African case study, we had the end of formal apartheid, but what remains is economic apartheid that has now benefited the South African elites, black elites, at the expense of the rest of the population. So they never had a revolutionary outcome that included the redistribution of undue privilege and wealth. What are... Uh... Gaza's opportunity. What are Gaza's opportunities for commerce, industry, and fishing? Is this okay? I'm sorry. My first reaction was to ask: Is this a rhetorical question? There's zero. I'm sorry for that reaction. Zero. The effect of the naval blockade and the land siege means that Israel controls all ingress and egress of people and goods. Israel controls the airspace and controls the electromagnetic sphere as well as the population registry within Gaza, right? Nothing comes in and out of Gaza. Gaza can't establish its own trade. It's not recognized as a sovereign to establish its own trade. The pop they can't fish because of this blockade. And in this recent, in this recent war, Israel destroyed 42,000 acres of open Palestinian farmland. And I mentioned that there were ingenuities in the laws of war. So in the laws of war, you have to balance humanitarian safety against military necessity. So had Palestinian militants been shooting rockets from the farmland, that would be 
you can destroy the agricultural field because of the military necessity. You have to incapacitate the uh, military, right? Israel has announced and made clear, according to its military manuals and code of ethics, that it can attack even empty farmlands because they want to prevent them from being used in the future by militants. No, this is not funny. I, I don't need to make you laugh. This is a novelty in international humanitarian law about proportionality, that it should be forward-looking, that in order for Israel to defend itself, it should diminish Palestinians' ability to survive, so that all of the money that they receive is used to rebuild their homes, their schools, to survive, rather than to spend it on acquiring weapons and building up some sort of military capacity. So they destroy 42,000 acres of farmland. Which is not to say, and I should mention this, uh, they have built a network of tunnels. Right? The tunnels are real. I don't think that they're the reason Israel attacked the Gaza Strip because it didn't emerge until July 15th that that was a purpose for the war. But the tunnels are real. Israel knows about them. Hamas taxes their use because they built them. It's created 500 new millionaires in the Gaza Strip. So these inequities that we've seen are not just right between Palestinians and Israelis. They're amongst Palestinians themselves. There's an economic elite that's benefiting. There's always an economic elite that's going to benefit from warfare. Mm. There's always an industry that wants to sell more weapons. There's always a population that's excited about the siege so they can build more tunnels, right? This isn't, well, I'm not trying to say that Palestinians are angels, but that doesn't change a principal position against settler colonialism, right? And so this network of tunnels has been used uh, to help Palestinians survive, and it's also been used, as we've seen, to import weapons, and it's been used uh, for legitimate warfare reasons, even though Hamas is not recognized as a legitimate belligerent, to capture soldiers and then use that, use them as POWs in exchange for those who have been captured by Israel. Right? All of this is obfuscated, if anybody was paying attention, because suddenly, during Operation Protective Edge, when a soldier is captured, which is a legitimate, you want, you want people warring to capture one another's soldiers, right? I mean, I don't want war. But if there's war, and we believe in the regulation of it. But instead, the way that we heard it was that Israel, Hamas kidnapped a soldier. You kidnap civilians. You do not kidnap soldiers. And it was when President Barack Obama says to an entire world watching that this is barbaric to kidnap an Israeli soldier. <laughs> so the, the I, you know, Though we were set to believe that the problem was that Hamas used indiscriminate rocket fire into the Gaza Strip, which are ipso facto, by the way, war crimes, because you can't distinguish between civilians and combatants, we did more than that in our rhetoric, because we delegitimized any form of armed resistance, right? It wasn't just about the targeting of civilians. It was even targeting of soldiers became illegitimate. What is, in your opinion, your opinion, what is America, the United States, the least, in contrast to other Western countries, the President, the Congress, the House, the Senate, the reason, in your opinion, to support Israel in this covenant? Mm. Before the UN, financially, as you said correctly, the biggest part of the United States foreign aid goes to Israel. What is, in your opinion, the reason that the United States does this? That's an excellent question. And so, for those who don't know, what we could have approximated in terms of a solution by international legal mechanisms. The International Court of Justice, which was used and incapacitated, incapacitated by the United States, right? UN Security Council. US has exercised its veto power within the UN Security Council between 1967 and 2004, something to the tune of 37 times, to make sure that there was no way that the international community would intervene. 
And by the way, the U.S. is the U.S. has only used its veto power so systematically and so much. Second, to this to protect Israel was to protect apartheid regimes in Namibia, South Africa, and Rhodesia. So you can look up all that. All this is public. UN Security Council votes. So the U.S. You're right, so I'm just saying the. The reason that the U.S. is part, very central to this problem, beyond the economic and the military support. Why? The story begins um, in 1967, mostly, when, the, when it, it, it appeared that Israel was the David fighting against a menacing Arab Goliath. And so at that moment, Lyndon B. Johnson, also wanted to make sure that Israel maintained the qualitative military edge over its Arab neighbors. So that included two things, diminishing military capacity of Arab neighbors, increasing military capacity of Israel, who succeeded very much. Okay? And in that moment, the reason for it was in part moral, right? But it was also seen um, as a great proxy in the Cold War. Right? This would be the U.S.'s foothold, its largest, it's better than a military base. It's better than a military base if you have somebody that's actually serving that function for you. And the U.S., as we know, is um, keen on building military bases in order to establish its military prowess. As I learned today, 118 bases in Oahu alone on 26% of land. So, and now, however, the U.S. has expanded its military bases throughout the Middle East, so it really doesn't have the same function for Israel that it used to. It was very much about personal interest, national interest. And also after the, the end of the Cold War, that reason diminishes as well. So why then? Cold War has ended. They have military bases elsewhere. Why then continue to support this, even though the U.S.'s policy has been settlements are bad and we want a two-state solution? And the reason, I think, is one that goes much deeper than just national interest, but has to do with uh, two things. One is the seeping of Israel into an American psyche as part of America, right? Israel has now become part of the United States, even identity. And during many protests, right, against Muslims in the United States and, and their functions, if you watch these YouTube videos, the language basically says, Israel is our uh, westernmost front against Islamic terrorists. Mm. So there has seeped into the psyche of an American national imagination, public imagination, that Israel is, is part and parcel of our nation and is fighting the same war, for example, against terrorists. The other reason, frankly, because is because of special interests. Our, our democratic system is broken. That's clear to anybody. Yeah. If you're paying attention, 31 school shootings, and we can't pass a gun reform law. Special interests in the United States have wield serious influence. And it's real, and it can be studied, and it can be measured. And so in those instances, when the US administration from Carter, less so Reagan, Bush, uh, the first, Clinton, Bush, and Obama, when those administrations have tried to somehow recalibrate an outcome, Congress has wielded its influence in order to undermine those efforts. And so either the US is unwilling to do something, and when it is willing, it's unable. And we saw that most recently for those I'll do just the most recent historical example. The Obama administration wanted a moratorium on settlements. Senator Biden goes to Israel on his trip. Netanyahu announces the building of 1,500 new settlements. This is to its patron that has protected it diplomatically, provides for it militarily. We pay for it, we, pay, we subsidize the settlements. So you, the response should be, okay, Israel, you are out of place. We tell you what to do. And yet that didn't happen because what happened instead when Biden actually said that this is very disappointing is that members of Congress lined up to chastise 
Obama, and Biden to say that you cannot deal with a friend like that. Even if you were angry, you should have done it quietly. But nobody said anything about how Netanyahu disrespected their friend, right? And so this is, this is the inability of them to do something, and I think it's because they are, these are, these are folks, these are our representatives, have a lot to be gained from special interests that hasn't been outweighed by either um, votes or by funding. And so these special interest groups are not conspiratorial, they're just incredibly effective. I'm, should I call on people? Sure, I don't even know. I, I'm just wondering, do you see any positive effect from the movements that are going on in countries, and particularly Europe, where these non-binding resolutions are being passed? Um, the recognition movement? Yeah. So I think what's sad about this is despite Europe's willingness to support, Europe has done very little to help. Except for Europe is fitting a large portion of the foreign aid to UNRWA, to NGOs, right? There's a lot of the humanitarian aid Europe is putting with them, but has not exercised any of its influence vis-a-vis -vis the United States. And so what we see is that now, today, I think France was debating recognition. Recently, last week, it was Spain. Recently, it was Sweden and the UK. Um, and I think they're interesting. They're symbolic. Symbols are powerful. And I, I think they're necessary, but they're quite insufficient. Because 134 states have already recognized Palestine since 1988. Seems like we're a bit behind that now we want to do it again. Oh, and if that wasn't enough, we did it again on November 29th, 2012. Tomorrow will be the two-year anniversary. Hmm. And the UN General Assembly overwhelmingly voted to recognize Palestine in, as a non-member uh, state into the U, U, United Nations. And so why then the, re, the, the reenactment of this theater, this political theater? And I think it's because they are not prepared to either take the helm to negotiate a solution. Nobody wants this responsibility. And the U.S. has not ceded it. So it's that unwillingness to bear such a tremendous responsibility, coupled with U.S. insistence that it maintain control as the uh, sole broker. And so together, they, you know, we get these political uh, theatrics. What, Israel, what the European Union can do, and can do very effectively, it's one of the largest markets for Israeli goods. And so it could impose sanctions and refuse to be a market for those goods. And that would be effective. And that's actually something that's, actually, we've seen that as well. We've seen that as well, to the extent that now uh, the EU, it diminished this, but at some point was very firm that it wouldn't accept any settlement products into its market. We should see more of that. Oh, yeah, I have something to say. Um, I'm an American. I don't know how many Americans in this room. But we can't even help the Palestinians because who runs America? We got APAC, American Israeli Public Affairs Committee, who runs our Congress. Oh, Since I, sir, can I interrupt? I, I don't think that's appropriate, actually. I don't think. That APAC runs America. I don't think anybody. Well, runs maybe America. you don't, but maybe we need to see the documentaries that have been going on yeah. alone since 2003 of the devastation of the Palestinian people, and we can't do anything to help them. Well, what about can, the what about the Hawaiians who came? Then you, as a Palestinian here. state, America, the USS Liberty was attacked during the '67 war, preemptive strike by Israel. Murdering our Americans, okay? 34 of them, wounded over 170. We're going to take the compliment out of I almost 300. I, okay, thank you. I, I just want to say that I think that we should, that rhetoric like this, where we offer, where we somehow um, magnify one party's power unnecessarily is not helpful in, a, in, in this discussion. I think, that we're, I think that you're overestimating the, the, Are you serious? I'm absolutely serious, and I think that it's unhelpful. You better start watching some of these documentaries. Okay, thank you for the recommendation. Go to Alelo and watch the documentaries. 
Thank you for the on there. It's a city. I actually would like to ask you about um, the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement mm -hmm. and, and ways that people here can actually participate that's, that's it. Um, productively in, you know, um, addressing some of the things. Yeah, okay. So listen, as American citizens, we have a lot to do. And, and, the, and the thing that I was mentioning, Palestinians in this discussion, I'm really grateful for it. And on Monday, I'm going to have a discussion where I'm actually on a panel where we can be drawing parallels. Palestinians are not an exception, right? Israel is not an exception. Israel is an exceptional because of the support it re receives from the US, but it's not an exception as a settler colonial nation, right? Canada, the US, New Zealand, Australia. It's not an exception for being a grotesque human rights violator. Syria, um, Saudi Arabia, even Iran in some sense. So I'm not trying to paint this picture that somehow it's something we've never seen before. No, we see it every day. We live, we live, we're watching it every day. The difference is that I happen to be a human rights attorney of Palestinian descent with the privilege to have an education and to use that education for good. And I've chosen to dedicate it to a topic where there aren't, there's a dearth of advocacy and of advocates on this issue because of the repercussions that we can suffer from it. I've rarely been able to do a talk where I have not been personally attacked. I rarely do an interview where I'm not attacked for being young and a woman or a terrorist, right? So there's a high <coughs> price to pay to even have this discussion, and I'm not trying to say that it's different, okay? I'm just saying this is what I've been invited to speak about. And part of that is bearing responsibility that we're not spectators to what's happening, we're actually complicit. We're part of the problem. You don't like what you saw, guess what? Your tax dollars are responsible for it. And so the call from Palestinians in uh, July, 2000, July 4th, 2005, was to ask for those in solidarity with them to boycott Israel, to divest from holdings that Israel profits from, and to impose sanctions state to impose sanctions until and when Israel complies with international law and human rights norms, namely three things, allowing the refugees to return, the ending of colonization of Arab lands, and equality for its non-Jewish Arab citizens. So this is BDS, and everybody can participate, whether it's asking the University of Hawaii to divest its holdings from uh, those uh, industries that profit Israel, or if it's a church that decides to divest, like the Presbyterian Church has done this past summer to uh, pull out its portfolio from Motorola and Hewlett Packard and Caterpillar, right? And so there's different ways that we, we are not helpless, we are not spectators, we are all complicit and we're all empowered to be a part of the solution as well. This has been a really great evening, and I'd like to ask us if we could wrap things up with maybe a couple more questions, and then maybe some final Cindy, comments. Maybe you could explain uh, what's happening here and how people might be able to participate in some kind of I'm happy to pass this along to you. <laughs> I'm really, thank you so much, and I'm happy to take uh, questions off the mic afterwards. I know that we're having a reception. Thank you. Um, if you are interested in participating locally, there are a few different ways that you can do it. And actually, there was a sign-in sheet as you came in with your names and emails, and so we'll contact you if you're interested in doing more. There are a number of different things you can do. One is to sign on if you are an academic or a cultural worker to the U.S. Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, uh, which is in, to follow the Palestinian-led call. Um, there is a Faculty for Justice in Palestine chapter that has just been, uh, that we're just organizing to support those efforts. There's also a Hawaii Coalition for Justice in Palestine that, and a Friends of Seville um, Hawaii chapter and um, a uh, Jewish Voice for Peace Hawaii chapter. All of those are, um, 
are ways or things you can participate in. And when we follow up with email, you are invited to participate in any of those things. And we really hope that you'll come on Monday to the University of Hawaii at 5 um, to 8 at the Kamakapuakalani Center for Hawaiian Studies, where Nura will be in conversation with Ibni Milan and Andre Perez. And that will also be followed by some poets and um, people performing from a forthcoming issue of biography on life in occupied Palestine. I think art and culture are a way to keep dialogue going and to learn um, and facilitate understanding um, as a kind of first step, anyways, towards uh, addressing some of the injustices that, that Nora has been talking about. With that, let's say thank you. And thank you. Yeah.